unless it's not Tuesday when you're hearing this, in which case, welcome to today. Uh, so we are here tonight with our very first Learn With Me, uh, the first one since I announced our new themes, which I'm really excited about. But right before we start that, uh, I want to throw out a massive thank you. I just got the word from YouTube today. They sent me the official email with confetti and everything that uh, we've hit 100 subscribers. So yay, thank you, YouTubers. I appreciate that. Um, and if you're catching this on YouTube or the podcast or Twitch or wherever you are, I really appreciate you. Um, just a quick reminder, if you would like to support this in the easiest possible way without spending a penny, if you have an Amazon Prime membership, you can use your free included Amazon uh, Prime Twitch subscription to subscribe to this Twitch channel, and then that supports it without you having to pay anything additional. So I would very much appreciate that. And if that's not a possibility, then just hang out. That's great too. So. Oh, hello from Wednesday. Yes, Grace is in New Zealand cheating a day ahead. It's good to know that the world will make it another day, which is what I always feel when I get a heads up from Grace. So that's awesome. So I'm going to bring in our, um, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to mention one other thing really quickly. Um, we are working our way slowly toward November and NaNoWriMo. So if you have any related NaNoWriMo questions, um, send them my way and I'll be happy to throw them into the queue. So let's do that. Okay. And then, ta-da, it's going to be our uh, Learn With Me, our first Learn With Me. And I'm very excited because I have a distinguished Learn With Me guest to educate me tonight. Uh, so this is, let me see, hold on, magical. Where's my button? There's my button. Okay, Kelly, hi, welcome. Kelly is now on screen with me. <laughs> All right. Um, so Kelly, uh, Kelly McCath Moran is a PhD candidate at the Memorial University of Newfoundland uh, in the folklore department. And her particular areas of academic interest, oh no, I'm checking my notes because this is like wordy, wordy academic language. It makes me feel like my, my, my IQ is going up two points just saying this. Uh, her particular areas of academic interest are narrative constructions of power and performance theory of activism in the animal rights movement. And uh, the way I know Kelly, um, the way how we first met is she is also a writer of fiction and then also of non nonfiction and poetry. Um, and we were in some anthologies together, which is how we first met. But in her fiction, nonfiction and poetry uh, career, Kelly has been a Washington Science Fiction Association Small Press Award uh, shortlist E, is that the right word? She has been shortlisted for the, <laughs> and she has also been nominated for the Wrestling Award and the Pushcart Prize. So. Yay! Thank you for joining me, Kelly. I'm thrilled to have you as my first Learn With Me guest. Um, and the, the concept here behind the Learn With Me. Yay! So, and we have a ton of hellos coming in in the chat. Um, so <laughs> there's uh, lots of, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of hellos coming in. So um, guys, as we go, feel free to feel, feel free to throw any questions for Kelly into the chat. And um, I will be happy to mix those, but we're, we're just going to have a great time because we get to talk about folklore tonight and I am thrilled to do this. So um, let's start with the really uh, kind of hanging in the air question. Kelly, what is a folklorist? How do you do, do, do you get paid for telling stories? You know, how does this work? So tell us this. We might we might study performance. We might study narrative. Oh, um, hang on, Kelly. I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Uh, it sounds like we're not sure. getting your voice your voice coming through. Um, hey guys, I am okay. Playing with some. Oh, okay. Do we have Kelly say something? We're going to double check. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. It looks like. Is oh, chat says we're fixed now. Hooray. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Great. So sorry. I. Took me a second to get that organized, but now we've got you back. So I was hearing you, but no one else was appreciating. So can I rewind you and please tell us again Absolutely. what is folklore? 
Well, I had a chance to practice, so now I have it right. See, it sounded really good. Um, I liked it. So, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Well, thank <laughs> so. you. <laughs> okay, so um, so folklore is the study of expressive culture, and folklore scholar Dan Benamos very famously offered the definition that fol folklore is um, artistic communication in small groups. And so what we study is the way people make culture. And I'm gonna start in a different place than I did when nobody could hear me. Um, for instance, I'm on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, and um, a perfectly legitimate study of folklore in Cape Breton might be the steel mills in Sydney, or coal mining culture, or processes around coal mining culture or steel, steel mills. And we wouldn't necessarily be looking at okay, from a technical perspective, how is this done? We're looking from a human perspective. What is the work culture around this process? Um, you know, how do people talk about it? Is there any vernacular language that people use? Um, if we have smelters, are there any colloquialisms? Um, do smelters have names? You know, it, has the equipment been named? That kind of thing. So we're looking at the cultural component of work life in that situation. Um, we can also study religious beliefs, whether they be major world religions or um, vernacular religious movements, folk beliefs, that kind of thing. Um, superstition, uh, although the word superstition is fairly loaded, you know, um, we, we might study vernacular architecture. Why was this building built the way it was? Um, what was why was it important to put um, um, these stations in this circle for people to go and pray? Um, why, why was this, um, why was this stupa, this, this Buddhist stupa put up? You know, what, what is the function of this and, and how do people interact with it? Um, we might study music and the, the particular branch of folklore associated with the study of music is called ethnomusicology. Um, we might study performance as in theatrical performance or um, performances of everyday life. And, and that's something that I'm very interested in, the average everyday performances of, you know, when you're performing as an, a person in an office, what's that like? When you're performing as a mom, what's that, what's that like? Um, when you're performing as a pastor, what's that like? These are all different kinds of performances um, from a performance theory perspective. And of course, we study narrative which has really close connections with the writing community. And it's the reason I've been writing a newsletter for the last couple of years that connects folklore to fiction. So that's sort of in a, in a very sort of broad strokes, what folklore is and what we study. Just think artistic communication in small groups and think expressive culture. And that's really cool. I mean, I was listening to you talking about this and, you know, when you said like, do they name the, the, the equipment, the smelters. And I'm thinking like, no, this is the kind of thing that we think of is so minor and so inconsequential. And, you know, I'm not even going to tell people if I name my car or my chair. Right. But, but from a, you know, cultural perspective that says a lot about a society that names their chairs, right? Like that's, um, or the individual who does that in a society that generally doesn't, or, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, so yeah, it's really, and, and uh, so I'm listening and I'm, I'm just curious, like with a lot of the things you mentioned, I, I intrinsically associate with the word folklore. Some of them I don't. So when you're talking about, you know, folklore versus I'm going to pull out anthropology, you know, is there a dotted line somewhere in the middle? Like what, um, is it more that, you know, is it, do we consider it more an artistic thing or, or what, what's, where's the line there? Right. Um, well, when, when, um, when we're looking at anthropology, like I've, I've heard folklore described as sort of a subset of anthropology. Um, so, and, and I, I had a minor in anthropology many moons ago. So I, there's cultural anthropology, which studies culture. There's linguistic anthropology, which studies language. Um, there's physical anthropology, which studies, you know, which is very closely related to archeology. Um, span And so, so, we're not necessarily interested in interpretive work in archaeology, but we'd be very interested in finding out what can be understood culturally from, from what archaeologists talk about, how they narrativize what they find. Um, cultural anthropology, I think, is very closely related to folklore, 
but um, we'll move into, as folklorists, into things like performance theory. We'll move into ethnomusicology, and we'll look for nuance. Um, we tend not to be very broad stroke um, uh, researchers. We tend to look at small groups, sometimes individuals. Um, one of the things that I look at in my own research is, you know, you have 10 animal rights activists, and they're all going to have 10 different ideas about um, their performances of activism and, and what they think ethically and that sort of thing. So, so I'm not necessarily looking to generalize and draw broader conclusions, although I will do that. I'm always very careful to say, okay, this is what I think I understand up here, but these are the nuances and these are the individual voices. So nuance and individual voice is extremely important to a folklorist. Um, does that help a little bit? I'm, I don't think that's the yeah. best answer I could possibly give you, but that's well, the one I've got I, I didn't tell you the question was coming. So for off the cuff, it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, I think you're, you're describing something that, you know, what I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking about when I write, you know, I've done some historical fiction and I can easily look up, you know, what was the map of this city 2000 years ago that we've excavated today? Or I can, you know, the plenty of things, but then I got into a point where I'm like, okay, what were the various views on breastfeeding in that particular? Well, archaeologists haven't written that down. Nobody, nobody has, you know, like how, how, how many people were, were breastfeeding or versus using wet nurses versus whatever. And like, how would we know this? And, you know, all of these kinds of things. And, um, okay. That was a pretty odd example to pull out, but it's one that I, I, I personally struggled with in the back, uh, in the past. And, um, so I really like what you're saying about finding, you know, it, it's not, no culture is a monolith of everybody believes one certain thing. Everybody practices one certain thing, you know, saying, uh, you know, how, you know, yes, this was the general gist of this, but you're always going to have, you know, a bell curve always has two ends. You know, so. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the other things too, you were talking about archeology span and one of the things that, 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 um, gosh, how do I phrase this? Um, archaeologists have to interpret what they find. And that process of interpretation is a process of narrativization. They create a narrative. And that narrative certainly is rooted in the science they practice. But it is still a narrative. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I had a, a leapfrog moment when you were talking about narrativization and the process of narrativization. And one of the things folklorists do is we study that process of narrativization. Um, and, uh, for instance, um, if I may be a bit political and talk about QAnon, um, when we're talking about some of the underpinnings of this conspiracy movement, um, there is a, there's a narrative, by, a narrative process that's happening and folklorists understand that there is a narrative process happening here and we can identify, okay, this is what's happening here. Okay. And now this is happening next. And, and I, I wrote um, a special edition on conspiracy theory a couple, of, uh, a couple of months ago for the Folklore and Fiction newsletter. And I think um, Philip Stevens Jr., when he was writing about the Satanic Panic in the 1990s, um, which is the Satanic Panic itself is a, is a, um, a moral panic rooted in legend. So, so he said, folklorists have an obligation to bring what they understand about narrative to contemporary events and help people understand that um, what's happening is a pattern and this is what the pattern looks like and this is how you identify the pattern. And so that's another way I think folklorists are different from anthropologists, especially as it concerns scholarship of narrative. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm, again, like I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm connecting it with things in my head, you know, so my day job when I'm not playing with my imaginary friends and making them fight each other, um, is in behavior, uh, mostly animal behavior, but there's a lot of human behavior that's connected with that. And they're not as dissimilar as people would like to believe. Um, but one of the things we're constantly battling is the idea of the explanatory fiction of, you know, Oh, uh, my dog barked at this child on a, on a bike because he must have been scared by a bike in the past, or this dog is shy, therefore he was abused or, you know, whatever, because the human brain for very good reason is designed to connect things and to extrapolate between them and project between them. And that's a really useful trait in a lot of areas. It's 
less useful when we're trying to make up data <laughs> that doesn't actually right. exist. And um, so knowing how that works, I mean, just just knowing, you know, myself knowing that my inclination is going to be to find a connection where there may or may not be one allows me to be more skeptical of connections that I have not actually observed. Right. So, um, yeah. that is, you know, something that is, uh, constantly, uh, oh, what am I doing? We're, we're just something we need to be aware of and something that we're trying to stay on top of, uh, as we are playing with, uh, these concepts and just, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I don't really have a point to make. I'm just taking what you're saying and going, oh yes, this no, makes it, sense it, because it does. Getting, and I'm hearing you talk about um, narrativization in the behavior, the animal behavior community and how in your work, what you're trying to do is, is understand the narratives that your clients are creating around the animals in their lives. And um, you understand that there are patterns here. You understand that, um, for instance, my cat Salem, and this is true, my cat Salem, um, we rescued him after he was struck by a car. And, um, you know, now I have a narrative in my head that says he hates to travel because he was struck by a car. And that's a narrative that I've created. And I don't know whether or not it's true, but I certainly give him, I, I certainly give him a little something to calm him down if I have to take him in the car, you know. Right. But yeah. that, that's, a, that's a process of narrativization. That's a process of creating story in our minds about our lives. And it's, it's human, as you say. Yeah, and Natalie's pointing out in the chat, um, Natalie also works in animal behavior. And um, you know, she's talking about sticky narratives like dominance, which is something that was introduced culturally, what, six, seven decades ago now, was disproved four or five decades ago now, but has stuck in the culture so much that, you know, no matter how much the scientific community says, like, this isn't a thing, it's a narrative that feels so good to the average layperson. you know, oh, no, I am owed respect and, you know, and, and all of these kinds of things that it's, it's just so hard to get those roots out. Um, you know, that that's a weed that won't let go, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah. it's, uh, it, and it's one of those things where it's like, I can look at it and I can say, okay, I see why this is working for you, but at the same time, it's really not working for you. <laughs> you know, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and, and that's, that's a really, um, uh, a really interesting thing that folklore can do. Um, there are, there have been folklorists, contemporary folklorists who have studied narratives around age and narratives around illness. And in understanding these narratives, we come to understand how they're culturally derived and how they're passed and how they're transmitted. And, in you know, it's, it's not my place to make a judgment about, you know, these narratives. But I do think that it is my place as a scholar of narrative to say, okay, um, this is what this looks like. This is what this pattern looks like. And um, this pattern has various and sundry hallmarks. And if you're looking at, at this pattern, you're probably looking at this sort of phenomenon. And if you're looking at this pattern over here, you might be looking at this sort of phenomenon over here. And I'm specifically thinking again about, about conspiracy narratives as I say that. Yeah. And yeah. And I think, you know, saying this is part of a pattern does not, autom you know, that's not, I don't think any rational person would automatically dismiss something just because of a pattern, but it's also good to say, okay, let's look at this in context. This is something we can grasp additional about this so yeah um and you've, you've used an incredibly important word right there you've used the word context you said let's look at this in context and that's what we're always doing as folklorists we're always taking whatever we're looking at and we're looking at it in its context so it's nuance and context we'll we'll look down at the individual we'll look down at the context they're in um and and that's where the ethnography happens that's where we learn about yeah. um about the culture so we just got a question in the chat. That's, that's a great question. And I'm going to, um, be, because, <laughs> because, I, uh, I, um, we are in a delicate period pre-election in the U S and I really don't want to yeah. turn 
my chat people are always fantastically well behaved and we're just going to continue that here. Um, but, but I totally trust you're going to address this from a completely academic perspective. I'm just throwing a warning out there because of paranoia, because sure. social media. Um, but the question is a really fantastic question, which is, is QAnon unique from a folklorist perspective? Was there a version of QAnon, for, existence, for instance, in the Middle Ages or other times in history? It seems like it's uniquely dangerous from a contemporary perspective, but maybe this isn't, isn't the case from a historical perspective perspective. So I'm thinking of some things when I read that, but please give us a, a, a informed take on that or just on conspiracy oh, in general. Thank you, questioner. Yes. Thank <laughs> you so much for asking that question. Um, okay. So this is a, a bit of a long answer. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to look back a little bit at a paper that I wrote um, at, for, for one of my PhD classes. And um, I don't, you know, we're all of different different age ranges and so forth. Um, for the sake of the audience, I'm in my early 50s, so I was in my 20s and the 90s. And I was growing up in the 1980s. And I don't know if your audience is familiar with a phenomenon called the satanic panic, but I'm going to describe it just in broad strokes. Yeah. So the satanic panic was a movement um, in the that began in the 1980s, whereby um, in sort of the zeitgeist in, in the ether, people began to believe that children were being um, abused by Satanists. And um, it became a, a major source of grief around the world, um, especially in North America. Um, there were instances of Satanic panic motivated behavior in England, in Norway. And what basically happened was that, that even, um, even mental health professionals began to believe that these children had repressed memories and they would be taken into to therapy and they'd be led down a garden path with these, these leading questions designed to produce answers like, yes, I was, you know, I was abused by a Satanist or yes, I was in a ritual or whatever. And uh, Geraldo Rivera had um, shows on, on Satanism um, there was, there was a belief back in the day that, that D and D was, was satanic and it caused innocent people to go to prison for years. It caused parents to lose their children. It damaged the mental health of people who were, um, given into the care of mental health professionals who were sort of trying to root out, um, Satanism or evidence of Satanism. And it's, it was a conspiracy theory that built upon itself. And one of the things that conspiracy theory scholarship says is that the narrative don't have any sort of real grounded place to go um, because they're not grounded in anything that's actually happening. They're only grounded in the stories that are being told. So this, is, this, was, um, this was a conspiracy theory that was widespread, that was building on other people's stories. And it was so successful that mental health professionals became involved, um, law enforcement became involved, government became involved. And we know that this sort of um, conspiracy theory, this sort of moral panic is rooted in legends. And what I mean by that is that legends are narratives that, that have the aura of truth. They might be true. And one of the things that we look at when we look at narratives and uh, legend narratives is, oh, yeah, you know, my best friend's hairdresser, Sally, her sister, it happened to her sister. And that means it happened. And we call that friend of a friend or foe. And the reason why it lends veracity to the narrative is because, you know, you, you just might know somebody who knows somebody it happened to. And there's all sorts of scholarship around legends. But when you, when you blend this sort of into the satanic panic narratives, what you have are people saying, oh, yeah, I knew that school where that happened. And that probably happened because I knew somebody that knew somebody it happened to. And because um, the media was often used as a means of creating very similar, not very similar to, that's the wrong word, um, validation for these narratives, um, we had the media coming in, and we had Geraldo Rivera coming in, we had law enforcement coming in, and if they're all saying it, then it must be true. And so we have these legends being built upon sort of, sort of castles in the air, being built upon castles in the air, and a lot of people were hurt. And when I look at QAnon, and I look at sort of the satanic underpinnings of QAnon, and I know some of your, your, 
viewers have probably um, heard this, this, this part of the narrative that there are children, again, being abused by Satanists. Um, it's the same thing all over again. It's exactly what, 30 years later, 30 or 40 years later, well, and, and here we are again talking thinking about as you're talking, children um, being abused. Yeah, one of the things that first came to my mind when this question came up, um, you know, talking, you know, from a historical perspective, I mean, you just jumped back 30 years, I'm going to jump back to the 1930s, when we had the same stories about the Jews doing things to children to justify a social movement. And then let's jump back a few more centuries to the the late 1400s, when uh, we had the, the all, again, the Jews sacrificing children in rituals and all of that, like, this is not you know, one of the great ways to get, you know, a moral outrage going is to threaten children, right? So, um, yeah. you know, you've yeah. got um, all of all of those four that are just off the top of our heads here are all about using children in rituals and um, in at least a couple of them, you know, consuming children in rituals, because I think QAnon also has them drinking blood occasionally and, and whatnot. Anyway, all of that to say that, you um, you know, that's one of your classic patterns on grabbing people's outrage. And as, I mean, let, let's be honest, if people are murdering children for rituals and consuming them, we should be outraged. <laughs> okay, like that's, but that's, people get so outraged that they don't check, stop to fact check. And so that's where you, it's really easy right. to grab things. So Right, and I would add, I would add that real conspiracies are sloppy. It's hard to keep conspiracies quiet. Um, the old adage goes, if, you, if three people know a secret, it's not a secret anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a real, honest-to-goodness conspiracy going on, bits of it are going to leak, and you're going to have, you know, you're going to have things that are sloppily kept in one place, and, and people are, and, you know, your, your good investigative reporter is going to get in there and start digging and unearth this little bit of information or that little bit of information. But what we find in these conspiracy theories or these, these sort of conspiracy narratives is that there's this vast group of people who are all keeping a secret. And that, that just isn't something we do as humans very well, you know. And I love that you took the narrative back further than, than just the 1990s, that you took it back to the 30s and you took it back to the 14th century. So this is a recurring moral panic. This, these kinds of narratives come up over and over again, and they're built upon themselves. They're not built upon anything that's actually happening. So tell your questioner, or I'm telling your questioner. Right question. Thanks very much. Oh, it was a fantastic question. Um, okay. So while we're talking about these patterns and these, um, you know, let's, let's just go ahead and call them real life tropes. Um, so uh, the... You know, we, you know, we have the sacrificing children in an evil ritual trope that, you know, we can pull out anytime I need some moral outrage. Um, you know, what are, uh, the, are the, these, these tropes are, obviously, as fiction writers, we talk about tropes a lot, and that we use them well or we use them poorly. Um, and uh, obviously, if I wanted to write a good conspiracy, I know some good ones to pull out right, kind of thing. What can uh, how do we how do we evaluate these tropes, um, you know, when they're happening in the wild, so to speak, like when we're, you know, the ones we just talked about or when we are pulling them in and trying to harness them for use in fiction? You know, is there are, are there ways we should approach these? Are there ways that we should um, use these for for better or for worse? And, you know, so. OK. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, um, as you were talking about that, that um, it, it rather depends on what you mean by trope. Um, in narrative study, we talk about motif mm -hmm. or small chunks of narrative that show up in many different kinds of stories. Like the number three is a motif or the handsome prince is a motif, right? And um, they can, we can insert those into our stories. And in fact, I'm working on a, um, a climate change fable right now that uses the number three. And I put it in there deliberately because I wanted for my readers to get that sort of idea that the number, that three things are going to happen, right? And it sets the reader up for a particular kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, these, these conspiracy theories, if you're writing a piece of fiction about conspiracy theories and you know how they're constructed, then you can set the reader up for a particular kind of experience because we, 
we internalize narratives constantly, especially in the digital age, because we're looking at the internet all the time, we're reading all the time, even if it's in small chunks. So um, when, when we are using a trope or a motif, um, we, we can set a reader up for a particular kind of experience. But we need to do that intelligently. We need to know that that's what we're doing. And one of the things that I, I was thinking about as you were talking is the trope of the, the badass heroine, you know, the, the, the female warrior who goes out and she wields a sword and she looks really great and she's super sexy and, you know, she goes out and fights the battle day after day after day after day. And, okay, that's, that, that trope is all very well and good, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't address sort of the, the, the idea of, of what it means to hold a literal or a metaphorical sword all day, every day for years. Um, so, so when we're working with tropes, we're working with motifs, they do stand-in work for us. So the number three will do stand-in work for me. The badass heroine might do stand-in work for a writer. Somebody who's writing about conspiracy theories, if they know how they're constructed, you know, they can set the pattern up and then work with the pattern and it sets up Sort of a resonance in the in the reader's mind but we need to make sure when we're doing that that um let's see i, I did have some notes on this because you prepped me for this question so let me just take a quick look um let's see uh, yeah a stand-in for deeper narrative work so so don't let your tropes or your motifs take the place of deeper narrative work when deeper narrative work wants to happen um, going back to the, the badass heroine, yeah, it's great to have a badass heroine. Let's have strong women in a, in a piece of fiction. But if you're holding a sword for a reason all day, every day, for years, what toll does it take on you as a person? That's the story I want to read. So that's what I would say to you about tropes and motifs. What do you think? I, no, I think that's great. And one of the things that, again, like, I think we're just bouncing off each other here. Uh, when you talk about motifs, while this is not remotely my field, um, I've always kind of secretly had a guilty pleasure in urban legends, right? So, <laughs> you know, and, and then the hook was dangling from the car handle and you know, all these great things. And um, one of the ones that I did use in a story um, was the classic story of the, the, the choking Doberman. So they come home and the, 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 the extremely condensed version, if you guys have not sat around the proper campfire, is they come home, the dog is choking, they rush the dog to the vet, they go back home while the dog's in surgery, and the vet calls them and gets out of the house because the dog was choking on fingers, so there's an intruder in the house. Okay, um, Right. And so I played with that, but that can be traced back to, I uh, should have done my research because I'm not going to remember the dog's name, but an ancient, ancient Celtic legend um, about a dog that is... Uh, covered in blood on on the king's baby's uh crib and so he kills the dog that uh um you know that because it was clearly trying to murder his his infant son but then the they he defines the body of the wolf that the dog had killed underneath the crib and you know all this stuff and um it's it's all the same kind of thing about the the dog uh and the intruder and whatnot but it's um you know what you're doing when you use one of those tropes or motifs is you're tapping into that yes heavy, heavy baggage of lore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a shortcut and it doesn't have to be a cheap or lazy shortcut, but it is a shortcut. So, um, yeah, sorry. That was just me yeah. going off there. In fact, I want to recommend a book. I'm going to pull up my bibliography here. Um, Gail DeVos. Let me see. Maybe I can pull it up quickly so that we can yeah. move right on. Um, DeVos. I'm trying to remember what it's called. Uh, yes, What Happens Next? Contemporary Urban Legends and Popular Culture, written in 2012, is a really good bit of scholarship on urban legends, if anybody's interested. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's... Um, Absolutely. It's And urban legends are so fun because, you know, they're, the new ones are coming up all the time. And, you know, for, it's, it's so easy to miss that it's an urban legend. So I'm going to since we've already danced along the edge of the political here today, I'm going to, I'm going to spiral and twirl a little bit more right on the edge. But the one that I keep seeing in all of my social media, um, 
it is amazing how every single person, um, you know, has a friend who went to get a COVID test, but left before the test was performed. And three days later, got a letter that they were positive, <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, I, I'm just like, nobody's thinking about the fact that, you know, this is an area of the country where it's taking 10 days to get results, but they're getting a letter by mail while the mail is slowed down in three days. And, you know, and and all of these things that are, that are tells that obviously this can't be happening in all 50 states simultaneously, you know, like this is. And that um, is absolutely a legend pattern too. My friend, you know, my friend's friend went to get a test. And then three right. days later, you know, that's right. a very right. Right. Yeah. narrative, like, right? And and what you were saying about, you know, the number three, it has to be the number three. And it's arriving, you know, by mail and, and all these things. And and it was just like, you know, the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And the second time, and then I realized, wait a minute, I have just heard this from people in 10 different states, all in the identical story, all in the identical hi, you know, and, um, right. Exactly. And that's not to say that something like that could not have happened because lots of times this stuff is rooted in something that, you know, has, has truth to it, but then it very quickly gets morphed into the, the urban legend format. And, um, you know, so what was there, was there a mix up that prompted all of the, you know, who knows what, what actually kicked this off? Was it purely, was it purely engineered for effect? Was it, you know, who knows? But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's one that I look at and I'm like, okay, this is going to be, you know, our future generations hook hand, you know, <laughs> like, the, like the too silly for, for words, right? you know, and, um, you know, so anyway, I'm just uh, appreciating things as they go by. So, um, so as yeah, that's, that's a really great one. Yeah. Yeah. So since I just talked about like how future generations are going to interpret this story, um, you know, as somebody who, you know, studies exactly, you know, the process of story coming down through generations, do we learn about story itself? You know, what makes narrative more resilient or more durable um, in order to descend? Whereas is there some types of narrative that is more subject to modification or being forgotten or something like that? That's a, that's like several different questions. So I'm going to kind of take it apart in pieces. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about story transmission. And um, so let's take a look at just for the sake of argument, the child ballads, uh, the child, the English ballad tradition um, written down by Francis James Child. And, um, he collected versions of these these ballads and he would collect one from over here and then he'd collect one from over here and, and over here sort of this verse would be different or that verse would be different um and he would collect them from different parts of the country and the same thing happened with sort of german fairy tales german wonder tales and that sort of thing because they were being transmitted via oral tradition and so basically what that means in terms of let's let's look at ballads for a second um, you'd have somebody in one village who knew the air of a ballad and sort of knew the story and had a set number of stock phrases that she had access to that really resonated with her audience. And she would know the story and know the air. And because she was perhaps not literate, she would essentially compose the piece while she was singing it, um, which is a phenomenal thing to think about. But if you go, you know, 100 miles away, that ballad might be sung by a man who had a different set of stock phrases, but the same general air. So if he composed the same ballad or the same story, um, he would compose it slightly differently. So you would have, because people didn't have, you know, YouTube, um, they would they would have a version of a ballad in this village and a version of a ballad in that village and a version of the ballad in this village over here. And the same thing happens with wonder tales and that sort of thing. And so when you have oral transmission of a tale, you have many versions. And I want to really, because I believe strongly in this as a scholar, um, I want to talk about the process of intextualization and and I want to problematize it just a little bit. Um, When you take one of those versions um, and you write it down and you're the first person to write that down, because we as sort of a, a, a global culture or Western culture, what have you, because we have 
and do favor the written word. Um, anything that is te contextualized, anything that is written down becomes the canonical version or the, the official version. And that's not, that privileges that particular version of the tale over other versions of the tale that John sang over here in the North and Mary sang over here in the West and Sally sang in the South. Just because you got Diane to sit down and sing the song for you so that you could write it down doesn't mean that Diane's version is the essential version. And so I think that's, that's one of the benefits of, of having a ballad tradition like, like the, the child ballad tradition and, and then having Francis James Child go out and collect various versions is that we, we don't have just one official version. So um, we have many. Um, and those are still being created. Those, those ballads are still being adapted. They're still being sung. There, there are new versions happening all the time. And the neat thing about that is that once you have, um, you've written something down, let's say you have five versions, and, and even if you don't want to call them the intextualized canonical versions, you've got your five versions, right? Okay, you've got somebody who comes along and says, all right, I see these five versions. They're all ballads, but I'm a new singer-songwriter, and I want to write a new version. And then you take those, and you write a new version, and you sing that new version, and then somebody in the audience listens to you and has a really good memory, sings the song on the way home, and teaches their grandmother. You've got a piece of oral tradition that's become intextualized, that's become oralized again. Yeah. So... So story is really cool that way, especially um, when we're talking about sort of the earlier oral, oral, oral tales or orally transmitted tales that get written down. And, and so I, I personally, especially because I'm, I'm terribly fond of the child ballads, and I just recently rewrote one because I was mad at it. Um, and uh, I decided that something else needed to happen in that ballad that happened in that ballad traditionally. Um, did you and, fanfic um, a ballad, uh, Kelly? Did you fanfic I, a ballad? I, I totally, no, I totally fanfic a ballad, okay? <laughs> um, it, it, um, uh, it's the Twa Sisters, and it's also been called um, uh, The Wind and the Rain. And in this ballad, which is, Lorena McKennett's done it as the Bonnie Swans. If mm -hmm. any of you know the Bonnie Swans? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so in this ballad, there are two sisters. And this dude comes along, and he's either a prince or he's like a, just a dude. And he comes along, and he's dating them both, which is crappy. And so what do the sisters decide they're going to do? And they decide that they're going to fight over this dude. The only possible solution. The <laughs> right. And it makes me so mad. Um, and so I decided that what should really happen in the story is that when one of the sisters pushes the other off a cliff, that the sister should push Johnny off the cliff. And so that's how I rewrote it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, it's a murder ballad anyway. Somebody's got to die, right. so it might right. as well be the jerk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I think that's why, um, and and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to jump back to the chat, but I, I want to say that there was an actual story, like, like for real really happened um a couple of years ago where um you know the the uber dri uber driver lyft driver whatever the rideshare driver um was driving a woman to an address and it turned out they were both uh the girlfriend of the guy at this address um i'm skipping over a lot of details but they discovered mm -hmm. you know that and so and they, so they had the conversation in the car en route there, and then they went up and rang the doorbell and greeted him together. And I think why that story got, you know, it happened, but then it got shared is because we all found so much, yes, finally, you know, and there were, it's right. not a, oh, guy is a jerk, so the girl has to die because that's the only logical, you know, result from that. And, um, and I think right. that one just, you know, hit onto a lot of us and as a, as an answer to the kind of, again, whether or not we're consciously thinking of that, those stories are culturally embedded in things we've heard just in the background. You know, they're they're deep in there somewhere. So, well, and I loved what you said about the, the written word automatically getting priority in our culture. Because um, Natalie pointed out in the chat, this is jumping back when we we're talking about urban legends, um, that urban legends can move 
faster and more widely and um, with less, you know, uh, Con- tracing ability today uh, because we have copy paste and quick share before Facebook blocks it and, mm-hmm. all, and all of that going on. And yeah. what I was thinking, you know, about my, uh, my COVID urban legend um, was that that gets more credibility because it's shared in a written form, you know, where if I told you yeah. around a campfire, oh, a friend of mine knows a person who got, you know, that would be automatically skeptical, but because you know, we put it in text, it must be real. And then um, Natalie's talking about being shared and then, you know, so much more quickly. And then you're talking about, and we give priority to text. And I'm like, this is exactly why, um, you know, I was reading some fascinating studies just on uh, disinformation on the internet in general and how it moves 4.5 or whatever the exact number is times faster than truth. And I'm like, yeah, truth doesn't stand a chance, you know, not when we have all this juicy, uh, juicy uh, outrage, you know, (laughs) conspiracy ready to go. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, just looking at those, uh, those motifs and how we tap into them, it's a great way to, to get us to buy into a story, whether it's real or not. Um, You know, we want, we want to tap into those things that are familiar. And um, especially if it addresses something we consider as a little bit of a gap. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and when we're talking about, you know, you were talking about the Uber driver and, and the culturally embedded story that got turned on its head in that moment. Um, And I think that's what happens too. You know, there are a lot of people who are doing to bring us in this sort of a more literary um, um, focus. Um, A lot of writers will retell a fairy tale and that's, that's okay. You know, that's interesting. But what's more interesting, I think, is to understand what's happening in the tale and then subvert it, um, bring it into a contemporary context, um, turn, it, turn the narrative on its head. Um, you know, there, there are so many um, instances of, of widows and wicked queens and so forth in Wonder Tales where the widows and the wicked queens and the stepmothers are evil, but perhaps they're not evil and this takes us right to sort of Broadway and Wicked and so forth, but, but perhaps they're not evil. Perhaps they're women in the middle of their lives who have come into their power and have to be silent. And so I think it's worth looking at what's happening in a wonder tale, whatever it may be, or a ballad, or a legend, and finding out where, where, what are we being asked to take on board? And is it something that, that we want to take on board? You know, critiquing the narrative and finding out whether or not we want to internalize it. And as writers, if we don't, what can we do to change it? Yeah, and and sometimes just being aware of, and and here we're going to venture into, a, I guess, a responsibility topic. I don't know, but um, just being aware of what are, what is in that cultural baggage of those those um, you know motifs that we're bringing in, and you know that not that using any trope or motif is, is going to be inherently wrong, but are we, um, is everything we want to say, is everything that's being said in that motif, something I want to say in my story. And, um, you know, that's not, you know, sometimes the answer to that question is yes. You know, it's not, it's not an inherently that, you know, all of this stuff is bad because it is a trope or because it is old or because it is, you know, from a particular culture or whatever. It's, um, it's just something that I guess just let's let's just think about and be aware of. You know, am I am I mm-hmm. making a am I using this without thinking, or am I making a choice? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And am I expressing internalized narratives um, that that I took on board because of my skin color? Um, you know, I, it's it's worth mentioning, of course, that we're two white women having a conversation about narrative, and and if we're going to talk about issues of responsibility then we have to talk about internal interrogation as well. You know, um, what were we raised to believe about other kinds of people, um, other people who live other lives, people whose skin color is different, people whose um, gender is not our gender, people whose sexual preferences are not ours. Have we taken anything on board that is unhelpful? Um, have we taken a trope on board? Have we taken a stereotype on board? So when we're writing as, as um uh, as writers, as writers, when we begin to write a piece of fiction, what are we bringing to it ourselves? And what do we need to deconstruct internally in order to be able to tell a good story? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. All, all of that. Just, you know, it's it's so easy to um, 
to you know just put out what we have taken in without pausing in the middle to sort and um i was invited to speak at a university uh class uh year or two ago. I don't know. It's 2020. I have no sense of time, but um, (laughs) 2019 maybe. Um, And one of the things I I talked about with them was I'm like, don't try to change culture by going out and saying we need to change culture. Like you want to change culture, you have, you, you write the better stories. And though that um, grabs, you know, people, you internalize narratives so much more than they internalize lecture. And, um, I am one of the things I'm working on right now to more or less success uh, is my Japanese language skill. But one of the things that I think is awesome is the word culture is written with the characters for writing and change. So um, like like writing is inherent to, you know, the culture. And I, I just, I find that uh, that made me happy as a writer to see that. <laughs> so yeah, That's it's really just, cool. It's yeah, it's just so in, inherent that you know if you if you control the story, I can tell you something, but if I tell you a story, that's what you'll act on more than whatever I told you in a you should do this format. And it's just that's that's well, always going to be how it is. That 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 applies too. I mean, it, it, any story that's been powerful for us, anything we've read that really resonated with us, um, it may not have resonated with another person in exactly the same way. You know, once I once I've written a story and I put it out into the world, it's not just mine anymore. It belongs to every person who reads it, and every person who reads it is going to have a different interpretation. So, um, story story hits you sideways. You know, it's it's not it isn't that sort of linear um, lecturing that you spoke of. It it is more it's more subtle. It's more nuanced. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and that's why it is used so broadly for social education, right? Like, um, you know, everything mm-hmm. from, you know, Aesop's fables to parables to, uh, you know, my grandmother telling me one time the little boy ran away from his grandmother in the mall and he was kidnapped and they've ever found him again. So make sure you stay close to me. You know, like those kinds of, of, of things mm-hmm. that, um, mm-hmm. you know, that the, the, the story is used for the, uh, to, to make the point. Um, and they're, They've, we still have Aesop's fables, you know, however many millennia later, because they were good at their job. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing about fables is that sometimes they were viewed as sort of speaking truth to power. And sometimes they were the tool of the oppressor. And if you look at Aesop's fables, some of them, I mean, they, they, they're self-contradictory in their messages even. Um, the, the morals often written below the tales themselves um, are, are, you know, you'll get a moral that says this and that A is A, and then you'll get another moral that says, you know, A is actually B. You know, I can't think of two good examples right now or I give them to you. But in, in going to your, your point about narrative as a tool of many different kinds of people, um, even Aesop's fables were tools of many different kinds of people. They spoke truth to power and they were also a tool of the powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and I think it, jumping back in this, this statement has been made, you know, already, but just to bring that back in here is there's not one monolithic opinion, you know, in a, oh, this is what the ancient Greeks believed because look at this fable, you know, that would be a uh, very uh, naive and disingenuous uh, interpretation of that, you know, to, to, and it would be a intellectually dishonest assertion to make because, you know, we know that mm-hmm. everything is much more nuanced than that. And so I guess, knowing uh you know to to bring this back into a practical um okay we're a bunch of writers and we're faced with all of this now we're we are now burdened with the weight of this responsibility you know what are things that we can do as fiction writers to be more honest with using these motifs or history in general or you know that sort of thing okay well, I, I've, I've got some, some thoughts on that. And, and I'm, again, I'm just going to kind of divide them up. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the resilience of the story. So we're talking about adaptations here. Um, how resilient is the story you want to retell to a retelling? Um, is it something like, um, well, the Marvel retellings of the Thor story and the Loki story and the Odin story? Uh 
Uh oh. Get a freeze. And to retelling. And there we go. Then, and they make Thor a superhero, and they make Loki sort of this ambiguous character or whatever. Um, it's fairly easy to go back to the source material and read the source material. And the culture itself, northern, the various Northern European cultures from whence these stories came, um, they're fairly resilient to having these stories retold. And so when you're looking at, at telling a story that's been told by another culture or, or has its roots in another culture, one thing that's good to look at is how resilient is this story to retelling? And there are lots of different factors that come into play. And one of them, and this is my second point, is power. Um, where, if you retell this story, who has the power? And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of indigenous stories. Um, and I'm not talking about indigeneity in, a, in sort of a broad stroke sense, but um, I am gonna talk about, I, I'm, I'm thinking about my, my um, one of the professors in my department, Sarah Gordon, who's done quite a bit of work um, in indigenous mining narratives, and um, in the demo, I believe it was, um, but don't quote me on that because it's been a while since I've read her work. But anyway, um, in some cases, stories are more than stories. Stories are way that ways that people remember who they are. And um, when, for instance, various indigenous cultures have been marginalized over and over and over again over the course of hundreds of years, Reclaiming ownership of a story means reclaiming ownership of a piece of culture. And so even if, let's say for instance, and I was trying to think about this because this is a question you gave me um, when you were talking about this before, um, before we, we got together this evening. Let's say for instance that um, a Métis storyteller tells a story from her culture and the CBC picks it up and plays it widely all over Canada and she wins a Canadian award for this story and the story is adapted into a film is it okay then because the story is then resilient for a person from another culture to pick that up and use it that's a big gray area because what does that story mean to her and what does that story mean to the culture that it comes from um, we may think of stories as having one set of meanings but other people, other cultures give different meanings to stories. And when, when a culture has been marginalized, as many, many indigenous cultures have been all over the world, um, as I said previously, reclaiming that story, holding on to those stories, is a part of holding on to identity. And it's a part of holding on to and transmitting culture. And there's, I, I, I'm very, very careful, even like I'm, I'm working on an indigenous character for a novel series that I'm putting together. And I've done a ton of research. She's Métis, by the way. Um, and I, I've done a ton of research and I'm trying very hard to make sure that while I don't believe there is an accurate way to represent any culture, just like you said, you know, we're not, we're not gonna essentialize a culture and say, this person is re a representation of all people of this particular background. Um, yeah. We're sensitive and we know where the power lies and we know whether or not the story we want to tell is ours to tell. Um, and I don't think I explained that as well as I could have, but I hope you got the gist. Yeah. And, and cause it's something, you know, again, as somebody who's written uh, stories set in and using other cultures, folklore is something I, I've tried to spend some time thinking about. And, you know, one of the things I look at is like, I, personally I'm not wholly in with the whole death of the author concept that you know once we produce a story the author's intent no longer matters it's 100% in the mind of the the audience and that sort of thing I, I don't yeah I'm not fully into that but because I don't not all into that then I have to say okay then any story I want to interpret and use I still has to carry the original intent and all of that in there as well and I think um you know, it's, it's something that we, we have to be aware of. We have to be um, considerate of, and we have to think about what we're doing with that story, what we're doing with, um, with that culture. You know, if, if I, a, a, a friend of mine um, who I'm not going to name because I didn't get her permission <laughs> to, you know, I don't want to put her on the spot quoting her here, but she is a, um, she is a writer of 
uh, of color of an, I'm going to say an extremely marginalized group in the U S and, um, as she said, you know, go ahead and, you know, and, and this, we're talking about a particular situation. So please don't take this as universal advice, you know, from, uh, for all situations from, you know, from this particular person, but she, her, her guideline for something was, um, you know, if you were trying to sell this to a traditional publisher who was going to pick up three books this this quarter, and one of them was going to be from a per- writer of color and a you know a uh, or you know a, a cultural story or something, and and the, oh, and you come in and take this, then you're taking um, you know space away from them. She says, but if you're self publishing it, there's that's not a zero sum game. There's all kinds of room. You know, go ahead. So I you know it's it's really one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of consideration and gray area that has to be, um, you know, considered just to be responsible, I would say. And I would, I would also say too, and as I was thinking about what you were saying, I had a a way to refine what, what I wanted to say just a little bit further. Um, Whereas I will write a Métis character. I'm not sure I feel comfortable telling a story out of Métis culture. Um, those are two very different things. Um, I think it's extremely important that all of us as writers are writing very diversely. I am very comfortable writing people of other nationalities, people of various abilities, people of other people whose experiences are not like mine. And I think we all need to do that. I think we need to be willing to do that. I think we need to be willing to do the work necessary to do it well. But Métis stories come from a small group of people who are classically marginalized in Canada. And those stories, owning those stories and owning what those stories say may well, and I cannot say are because I don't know, may well be an important part of the preservation of Métis identity. So there we have a narrative construction of power. If I take that story, let's let's say I take a narrative out of that culture, and I retell it, Um, even if I'm telling it faithfully, it's really, it may not be mine to tell, because I'm not part of that culture. So, and, and I don't think this applies broadly. I don't think it applies everywhere. I don't think that I only get to write stories about 51 year old bisexual pagan scholars. Um, But I do think that we need to be carefully aware of the, where the power is when we tell a story. As you say, if we're going to get a three-book deal and we've taken a story out of Métis culture and inserted it into that book and it was a non-faithful representation or um, it was a faithful representation but we're not Métis people, is that okay? I would say probably not. Um, but I would say that because I know that these, these narratives mean something different to cultures that are not my own. And I don't know exactly what a story means or a, a given story means to a, a Métis person. So yeah. I, I wouldn't know whether or not I should retell it, you know? Yeah. So, Is that and... any better? I, I'm, I feel like I'm struggling with this. No, no. I think, I think, because I think you and I are on the same page. So we're not... You know, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm following you because it's not that far a leap for me. Um, but I'm thinking about, yeah. on the one hand, you want to be really respectful of an identity. Um, absolutely. And I'm just going to throw out, you know, an example of what I don't actually think is the other side, but would be perceived by that maybe by some people. Um, in uh, Overwatch, you know, massively successful video game. Um, and one of the characters has skins that use Pacific Northwest tribal imagery and there was outcry you know when these when these launched because you know are you taking these these symbols and these this art and whatnot um and appropriating it you know for this for this game for this character and um there was a post that went around um and i'm gonna be honest i don't i can't verify the origin of this post the 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 writer says she's of the aac tribe i have no way to verify that right but i'm gonna believe her but she said it was incredibly meaningful for her to see stuff, you know, that she has not seen. She doesn't get gotten to live since she was uh, young to see imagery from her childhood, to see uh, 
clothing from her childhood incorporated in, in her and in this post she says there are fewer than 500 of us left we're not centralized you know for me it was very meaningful to see this in something that was so huge you know that was using something that is normally so minimal minimalized and um mm-hmm. so i think that just goes back to you can't assign an opinion to an entire demographic right but also i would not in any way take that as blanket permission to do what I wanted with things, right? Like that's, that's not remotely what that means. Um, and I think my personal rule of thumb, which is not necessarily the right one, it's just the one that I'm using at this time is I will write, uh, diverse characters. I will, I will write things that I feel that I can represent well, I will write, um, I'm going to say a black female protagonist, but I'm not going to write the black Mm -hmm. female protagonist experiencing racism in America, because I, that's not something that I, somebody else can say that way better than I can. Right. What I can say is as a black female protagonist being pursued by carnivorous mermaids or like late running dinosaurs or whatever that I got that. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think that's right. A, that's not a demographic specific experience, but I'm something that is very, very, you know, going to be very specific to that demographic, to that culture that I don't have a personal insight on. I'm going to let somebody who can do that better do that. So well, and that's I think my there's, personal there's a shoring up identity. Yeah, exactly. And there's, there's a shoring up identity thing that goes on, too. You know, if, if a story that you're trying to tell is another person's way of shoring up their own identity. Um, and, and again, I'm going back to various indigenous stories. Um, if, if these are ways that people know who they are, um, that's very, very sensitive material. You know, yeah. and that's not something that 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 those of us who who don't share that experience can ever really know completely, you know? Um, But, you know, again, you know, and I'm thinking now of the own voices movement, people who are are writing in their own voices, you know, people who have particular um, backgrounds or abilities or um, genders, sexualities, writing within that context. And I think that's very good. But I also think it, it reaches into sort of the lived experience ethnographic territory that I occupy as a scholar. Because, you know, if I'm going to come to you and interview you about your lived experience in animal behavior and as a writer and as a, a person who loves to travel because I know you do, um, I'm going to get your lived experience. And that's what I'm always looking for. I'm not going to go to somebody else and ask that person about you. Um, and when writers are working in the own voices movement, I think that's what they're getting at. They're, they're getting at, okay, this is my lived experience and I'm right. writing fiction from my lived experience. Right. So there's a real strong ethnographic quality to that kind of fiction, but I don't, and, and I think it occupies an important place in our contemporary conversation about what literature is, but I also don't think it's the only place and I don't think it occupies a superior place. I think that it occupies an ethnographic place. Um, and I recognize it um, as sort of a, a sister experience, I guess, in a very loose sort of way, again, to what I, I do when I go out into the field and interview people. And I think I'm just going to throw in like just me as a reader. I think it's important to remember that people are more than their demographic, too. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I it took me a while to identify, you know, what was frustrating me Um and you know why i didn't like why i thought i didn't like fiction with a certain type of protagonist and and all of that well what it worked out was is you know when i was in school every story i read with a black protagonist was a civil war you know message narrative kind of thing and you know no like like believe it or not black people exist today and they do other things other than talk about you know <laughs> and so letting them letting people be people is um you know not ever not not just let it not just uh, assigning all cultures to their own little boxes and you know letting you know it's a it's i, I don't know i don't want to i don't want to just go off on my soapbox here but i think um you know diversity does not mean having more check boxes it means more people. <laughs> so 
Well, and, and we're going to get there. You know, we're, we're having some difficult conversations, and we have been for some time, about what it means to represent people who don't look like us or think like us or um, believe like us, you know. Um, and I think that we are best when we, when we bring the nuance to the conversation. And we, we accept that, as you say, you know, no person is a representation of their, their entire culture. That, that differentia- there, there are power differentials in, in literature, that some literatures are more resilient to um, adaptation than others are for tons of reasons. And some of them have to do with um, the way mm-hmm. stories are, are um, held in various cultures that, you know, that while I have a particular lived experience because of the look, the check boxes that I check off, other people's lived experience is going to be completely different. And, and when we're better at this, I think as a culture, maybe we will be able to take that nuance on board once we've done some internal interrogation individually. And um, we, we know that we're scrubbing out the, the junk that we were taught you know, those, those narratives that, that aren't real, that aren't healthy, then we can, we can start to see greater individuality. I think I'm rambling at this point, but, but that's think, where I hope we go. I think I hope, we just we got go our... Toward greater nuance. Yeah, I think you and I just got the, our, the bit in our collective teeth and just like, yeah, this is the thing we feel strongly about and have thought about. So, <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and, and Natalie said a couple things in the chat that, um, you know, it's, you know, she, she was agreeing with me on my, my personal rules. So thank you. <laughs> I, don't, I was totally something I just made up for myself, but that's, um, that's where I'm, you know, sitting at this moment. And, um, you know, I think it's just, it's just something that we, you know, this, it can be summed up as, you know, think about what you're writing. Are you, are you through putting without pausing to evaluate in the middle and, uh, you know, taking what you've, brought in and putting it back out without pausing to to evaluate and I think we just need to be thoughtful writers and I think that's a universal statement anyway so yeah there's my Agreed. there's my nifty Agreed. little wrap up there <laughs> so um I want to make sure Absolutely. though that we talk about um because like I we will happily I know you and I will talk about this forever this is one of the things I actually um hey hey chat guys this is one of the things I really like about about Kelly is Kelly and I are actually from incredibly different places. Uh, you know, she just described herself. It's very different from a lot of, you know, Kelly is vegan. I eat steak. You know, we're, we're very different people, but we have so many, you know, respectful, I think, respectful and productive conversations even about our, our differences. And so it's one of the reasons I really appreciate you. And thank you for coming and talking to me today. Um, so I'm delighted. I, I was so happy that you that you asked. So thank you. I, I love getting my nerd on. So, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, but, Kelly, <laughs> but I want to make sure that, um, that we do mention that you have a new book that I want to throw out there to the, to the world, which is the longest road in the universe. And do you want to give us a, a quick, quick one or two sentences on? The, oh, look at the shiny picture right there. All right. Tell us about this. Okay. Um, this, um, the Longest Road in the Universe is a collection of fantastical tales. Um, all but one of them have been previously published. One of them was shortlisted for the Washington Science Fiction Association Small Press Award. Um, it isn't new. Um, it is a second edition. Um, I put out a first edition in 2016. So all the stories except for one were professionally published, but I had been asked to speak at cons and so forth, and I wanted something with my own name on the cover rather than um, having it, you know, taking this armload of anthologies that oh, I've right. been in. Absolutely, right? yeah. Um, so um, it's very difficult, as you well know, Laura, for people who published in small presses um, to sell collections. Collections don't sell super well. And um, so what I did was I published it myself, but I was just getting ready to head back into university for my doctorate. And um, there were errors in the text. And so I put out a second edition. And the second edition is this one. It has an extra story in it, and it came out at the beginning of this year. So um, you can buy it wherever fine books are sold. Um, there is, you can buy it by paperback or Kindle or Kobo or whatever. Um, there are links on my website if you're interested at all. It's right there on the, you know, my website is set up so that you have like a left bar, a middle, and a right bar, and the left bar has a little, a little blurb about the book. 
and the various stories that are in it. They're all science fiction and fantasy, and then there are links at the bottom for purchase. And speaking of your website, um, floating underneath you right at this moment is your URL. And I want to mention that you have a newsletter um, with a regular, uh, you know, I'm going I'm to call the clip notes on folklore. And um, you, yeah. you, you hinted to me your your new. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna start doing the the index. The oh my gosh, there's a yeah word. the AQ tail type. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to so, give us just a little bit on that. Sure, sure. Um, so for the last uh, nearly two years, I've been putting out monthly on the first Thursday of the month um, a folklore and fiction newsletter. And I've covered topics like myths, legends, tall tales, charms, curses. Conspiracy theory. Um, conspiracy theories. Um, this last one was language and verbal lore. The next one will be on child lore, um, lullabies, children's stories, that kind of thing. At the end of this year, after two years of working with what we would call folklore genre, I'm switching um, my topic, and I'm moving into an exploration of the ATU Tailtype Index, which is the Arne Thompson Uther Tailtype Index, which is an index of various kinds of folk tales and their motifs. And what I want to do with that is to give writers um, a look at a folk tale, a look at some of the motifs in the folk tale, a look at ways it might be subverted. I know that various authors, I'm trying to think, Shannon McGuire, I think, has done a whole ATU series of stories. So I'm hoping that by sort of um, taking apart a folk tale and um, taking apart where it is in the index and talking about some of its various um, iterations and variations, as we mentioned earlier in the program, um, writers who are interested in working with folkloric material like this, more traditional folkloric material, might find um, ways into writing their own stories from the newsletter. So that's going to be at least two years. Um, I'm toying with making it three, but I don't want to commit that far ahead. Um, and if it, if it totally flops after a year and people aren't interested, I'll move on to something else. But it's going to be at least a year of APU index. Yeah, and... I mean, I know that sometimes when I'm talking about, you know, folklore and because I, I, you know, do some panels and, and uh, uh, presentations, seminars, whatever on, on that. And a lot of times people will ask me about that index. So I'm personally following it so I can sound smarter when people ask me questions. So <laughs> that's why I'm in. Um, but I think, yeah, especially for uh, if you're into fairy tale retellings or whatnot, that's going to be a, a useful tool. So, um, Okay. And I had something else I wanted to mention, and it's gone. I got nothing. It's uh, It was there. I was thinking about it, and then I got distracted by something shiny. And um, You're a well, pro at heart. I really am. Just uh, <laughs> happy, happy little, uh, you know, I, you know thing, shiny things distract me. When I get mad, I screech. You know, that's really, that, that's it. You've right. got me. So, um, <laughs> so well, um we have been going a nice long time, which I don't regret at all, but uh, I probably need to wrap this because um, we're running a little bit longer. Okay. Oh, and oh, thank you. Natalie just threw your book up in the chat. So everybody's got a link to it. Thank um, you, Natalie. So, That's yeah. awesome of you. Yeah. So um, that is the longest road in the universe in paperback and ebook and all the things. So um, yeah. And I had a great time. Thank you for doing my first learn with me uh, with me. Uh, I think, I think this was fun and um, we were going to, we're going to have to do more things like this, but uh, yeah, I, 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 we haven't had any, uh, any new unanswered questions show up. So I think we can safely wrap at this point, but um, I'm just, thank you. Thank you again for coming out. And thank um, you. Thank you for having me. This was a, a ton of fun. We could have, yeah, you know, we, we'd be here till midnight if we just kept talking. Um, we absolutely but could. It, I, I know we've we would, done that. So <laughs> Um, um, and guys I, in the I chat, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And guys oh, in ahead, the chat, thank you for great questions, um, and commentary. Those, those are good. And then, uh, yeah, everything will be up for replay. Usually about 48 hours gives me a chance to get it up after our official Twitch expiration and get the subtitles up or the closed captioning, I guess, technically. So you can look for the replay then. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to officially call it, but uh, this was a blast, and um, 
Kelly, I hope you have an awesome, we're, I'm actually talking to someone in my same time zone, which is, I think the first time that I've done this here on the show. So, um, we're no, you're not. There. so yeah, no, you're so, not. <laughs> I'm in Atlantic time. What? No. Yeah. Oh, I'm, bother. I'm in Atlantic Canadian time. <laughs> I thought you were okay. So, so what time is no, it where you are? 920. Bother. I completely, now I feel like a jerk for not only using Eastern times when I was communicating with you. See, look at, look at my, You're fine. look at my cultural centrism right here. Everybody's on Eastern. So, okay. <laughs> I am a grown woman with a grasp of time zone. Oh yeah. I'm I very proud. Work. Well, apparently I, I missed the time zone uh, thing. Yeah. So, all right. Um, well, now that I've embarrassed myself publicly, I will. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you for working with me. All right, everybody have an awesome night. Um, oh, we got a thank you from the chat. Thank you. Um, and I am so sorry. I don't, Peepon72, I'm sure you have a, a less unwieldy handle, but I, I don't know it. But thank you uh, for, for being here and asking fantastic questions. And um, everybody take care, wash your hands, be safe. Love you guys. Bye-bye.